deterministic latency clocking is uh, based on sysref. And you really want to have a stable system reference uh, that, or depending on the stability of your sysref, you want to use a different type of sysref. So sysref is basically a indication of a fixed point in time. So when your system receives it, it will create this LMFC. Uh, and that sort of means that you cannot really use a service recovered clock for your uh, receiver or transmitter. You, you want a clock source, a device clock to be source synchronous with whatever is generating the sysref because the device clock will, will sample the sysref. Unless you can live with the clock domain crossing uncertainty added to your deterministic latency, if you can tolerate some variance, then you can, of course, do that. But like the clock domain cross the sysref into the service clock domain that you would then use as a device clock. But in general, you probably want to have separate clocking. And depending on the quality of that clock source, if it's very stable, you can use a periodic sysref. If, it's, if you're expecting some jitter, you probably want to use a gapped periodic. And if it's very poor and unstable, you probably want to use a one-shot type sysref, so a single pulse for the whole system, or maybe just generate a pulse without even the clocking source there. And you have to really carefully adjust the RBD I mentioned about, about before the release buffer opportunity or the delay, such that it, uh, the data arriving to your system doesn't uh, sort of um, go on both sides of the LMFC uh, boundary. And I'll show a little picture in a moment to explain this, uh, to prevent these uh, latency variations on the links to affect your total uh, deterministic latency. And also, you can control the LMFC period with the E and K parameters. So you should set it short when you want to sync faster, have smaller link latency, or set it long when you expect larger interlinks Q. And now to the example of how our RBD, how important monitoring and controlling RBD is, this is a, an example that uh, sort of demonstrate, demonstrates what can go wrong. As we saw in the previous example, this is the re receiver. It receives these two lanes with some skew, right? And this LMFC sort of dictates the release opportunity from the desk queue buffer. So we assume both of these data have gone into the desk queue at this point in time. They're there and ready to be released. So the desk queue buffer will be released, and both of these uh, data will appear here. But now, if you have one, plus one clock cycle of latency on the links, uh, your data arrives to the desk queue buffer, and at this point in time, where when it's time to release the desk queue buffer, it's not ready because this data has not appeared yet, and you have some data on one lane but not on the other. So the desk queue buffer will actually wait until the next release opportunity, which is one LMFC period later. So one clock of latency uh, on your lanes will actually cause a whole LMFC period of latency in your adjustment in deterministic latency and sort of uh, cause a big problem. But you can, uh, in most systems, you can monitor somehow the fill level of the buffer or the arrival times and adjust your RBD. So if you would actually move your release opportunity plus, for example, plus three cycles in this example, then whatever jitter or additional latency can happen here will not affect your release opportunity and you'll be able to release uh, safely even if the arrival times are different. So it's very important to control this uh, in order to have a good deterministic latency uh, in your system. Okay, pitfalls and traps number two, system startup and subclass one. We talked just a moment ago about using a one-shot type sysref with a uh, poor, uh, when you have a poor sysref uh, source. And what can happen is if your device, one of your sides of the devices in reset like the TX or the RX and you pulse your sysref and it's not ready to receive it, you will miss that opportunity. And then your system will hang there waiting forever for sysref because it needs to it needs a sysref to generate this LMFC local multi-frame clock. And you will be there like wondering, hey, I generated my sysref, but for some reason the system is not working. So that could be one of the reasons. And uh, touching again on sysref is what, can, what happens when the sysref is a uh, wrong frequency, like not adjusted well to your framing? Or what happens if the uh, sysref is jittery? 
a similar, similar thing happens. So basically your system will be detecting sysref pulses and adjusting your LMFC. And that only causes a situation on your next link reinitialization where your LMFC, LMFC is a little bit different. So the release opportunity of your disk queue buffer will shift in time in relationship to, uh, to your transmitter or, or your system in general. So you might have different total latency so that the determinism fails because it's not the same every time. So when, you're, uh, when you have sort of uh, doubts about your sister, sister of stability, it's better to use a one-shot type. Or actually, the GSD tool for standard requires uh, devices to have the ability to uh, either force alignment to the next incoming sysref or ignore sysrefs in total. So you can get one, even if the sysref is periodic, you can get one and then ignore all the rest. All right. And the final, final slide on pitfalls and traps. We're nearing the end. So this one is a little bit outside of uh, JSD, but I'll talk to it really quickly. The third is bit transmission order between your uh, JSD and your PHY. Uh, the PHY has a specific way it transmits the bits. It gets bits in parallel and then either sends the least significant or most significant bit first. And your IP core, the JSD, will also have a specific order. It expects those to happen. And if you have those flipped, uh, you might get uh, synchronization because uh, the, some number of times or always, but the data might be unusable. And it sort of uh, usually throws people off and they're not, sometimes they're not sure what's going on. And it's just a simple thing of flipping the bits. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that the standard, the tool for C standard, it's not very clear on the FEC and CRC computation order. I took some pictures from the standard here. So uh, this figure and this table, they're in the same chapter. And this figure actually shows you a computation for the CRC12. And this uh, table shows the truth table. We're not going to compute them now, but trust me that if you actually compute them, they show different results. And I think it's a simple matter of a typo, because if this would be six, zero down, up to 63 instead of 63 down to 0, then they would compute the same thing. Uh, depending on uh, on how you interpret this, you can you can then either implement it one way or the other. So it leads to some different architectures and incompatibilities between vendors. At our concourse, we solve this in a way that we actually implement both directions. And you can flip a bit in the configuration to have full interoperability and compatibility with everybody. Same thing goes for the by bit transmission order. We can switch to switch a bit and flip the data for you. So, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. 